Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome July 2nd, 1863. No, 2022, right? All right. Thank you so much for coming to join us here for Sacred Trust 2022. Some of you know that when I came here and joined the staff about a year ago, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Wayne Motts. I'm the president and chief executive officer here at the Gettysburg Foundation. Very honored to be here. One of the things that a lot of the members and visitors that came here to Gettysburg National Military Park asked me as the new incoming president and CEO is, Wayne, bring back Sacred Trust. Bring it back and have people come. So thanks to the park, Chris Gwynn and the interpretation staff, Steve Sims of the Gettysburg National Military Park, our partners working together and the staff here at the Gettysburg Foundation, uh, who's been working very hard to make this a great event for you, said, we're going to bring this back. And that's exactly what we did. And we have a first class lineup of speakers. For those of you that were with us yesterday, we went in and out. I'm hoping we don't have to do that today. We thank you for your patience uh, regarding the weather and some technical issues that, that we had. And it was well worth it because we had a great lineup of speakers yesterday, today, and we will have for tomorrow as well. I'm honored to introduce my friend, a person I've known for many years, and one of the most prolific authors related to the American Civil War. He is the author of 11 books related to the American Civil War, and we have his new book, The Heart of Hell, just came out the last week or two. I mean, literally. This is the first place that he has spoken on the book and will be here to sign immediately thereafter regarding the 20-hour struggle, 20 hours, longest sustained combat, I think, Jeff will tell you, anywhere for the American Civil War at the Mule Shoe at Spotsylvania. So historian and author extraordinary, he's from State College, Pennsylvania. He is a retired educator and one of the best speakers out there on the circuit, and we're so happy to have him with us today. So without any further ado, help me welcome author and historian Jeffrey Wirt. <laughs> Yeah, good morning. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been here, and everybody else I know, it's, I keep tell, thinking, you know, 2020 didn't exist, you know, and it's, it's one of those things. Uh, I always joke about this. Uh, Wayne tells me, you know, he said, I was a high school teacher for 33 years, and I joke that I get one question a semester. So if you have questions, please ask them. Uh, I'm going to allow time for them because I think they're important. I'll be honest about this. If I had a choice, I'd say right now, okay, are there any questions? And we go from there. But, you know, Wayne doesn't want me to do that, so uh, we'll, we'll go ahead. Last week I was in Gettysburg. Well, I was at the collector's show, and I was at one of the book dealers and sitting there, and this fellow comes up with his wife, and he has three books. And... She says to him, I think half serious and half jokingly, she says, I don't know why you keep buying and reading these books because you know the end. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, and I thought about that, we do know the end, don't we? We know how it ended up. When we say Appomattox, we're all there. And then as you know, Civil War buffs, we want to look at the threads. How do we get there? Where's the turning point? We want to give meaning, if you will, or context to things. And that's good, and we need to do that. I think one of the problems is they didn't know that. If you went to the camps that we're going to talk about in the counties of Culpeper and Orange primarily, in the Rapidanock and Rapidan River Valleys, in the winter of 1864, those veteran troops had no idea what that. They didn't know what Appomattox was. Now, you know, we know what Appomattox is. They could not have possibly known that. What did they know? Well, they knew that a time was coming when the spring weather came and the roads dried, that once again, there would be a reckoning between these two old foes. And they wrote about it. And the interesting thing is, if you look at, well, now, the Confederates in on one hand, they had a terrible winter. Uh, they were ill-supplied, they lacked food, they lacked forage, disease was rampant, desertions were high, 
it was an extremely difficult winter compared to the Yankees because the Orange and Alexandria Railroad uh, filled the gargantuan needs of the Army of Potomac every day. But what they realized and what they thought about is down the road. And they all believed on both sides that ultimately there was going to be victory, that we are going to prevail. Confederates believed they were going to prevail. The Yankees believed that they were going to prevail. One of the other interesting things about it was, of course, this was a little new because this is Robert E. Lee against Ulysses S. Grant. And if you read the Confederate letters, I guess the best thing to do is use baseball parlance. Welcome to the show, Grant. Welcome to the major leagues. You're now going to confront an army that you had no idea when you were out west at Vicksburg or Chattanooga. They don't compare to what we, we are. And they, f they believed that they're going to soon find, and they were looking forward to it, to prove that Bobby Lee would be better than anybody else. So that's what they, uh, they wrote about. And if you will, the reckoning came in May the 4th, 1864, when the Army of Potomac began crossing the Rapidan River at Eli's and Germana Fords. And it would take most of the day, and they're still not across. We know from that, though, the next two days, May 5 and 6, they would fight in what the Yankees called a demonic wilderness. They hated it. Confederates liked it because it negated Union artillery. But then the, the vic at wilderness, you know, casualties were, I think, in the neighborhood of 17,000 or so or more. But anyhow, from there, Grant, and that new thing. And I, to understand, I think Grant, there's this moment in the history of the Army I've always thought was one of the key elements of the Army of Potomac in their story. Grant had decided to go south. He's going to try to get Lee on open ground. He had 119,000 men when the campaign began. Lee had about 66,000. So the odds are clearly almost two to one. So he gives the order on May the 7th to start to shift south towards a crossroads, and that crossroads was Spotsylvania Courthouse. But that night, it was somewhere around 11 or midnight, Grant and his staff, and Meade and there's his staff, they ride down Orange Turnpike. And they come to the intersection of the Brock Road and in the woods, and there's some fires burning. Uh, there's a little bit of that eerie sense of what's going on. It's dark except for the fires. We're men of the Fifth Corps, and they all part, and they all stand, and they look. And in the past, what did the Army of Potomac do after a defeat? And you can argue that the wilderness was a defeat for the Army of Potomac. The Army of Potomac turned around and headed back across the river. Grant came to the intersection and turned right, and they cheered him. Because there was a sense in the Army that finally, at last, somebody's going to take us down that road that's going to end in victory, and it's going to bring us home and that's all that mattered and in fact the officers tried to silence the cheers because he didn't want the confederates to hear it on the opposite side of the wilderness that night lee had given the order to richard anderson who had succeeded a terribly wounded james longstreet who had been accidentally shot by confederate troops uh, to march that early the next day and head towards spotsylvania Anderson started to shift uh, the first Corps troops in line, and as I said, the woods were in fire. There was no place to really go. So what they did is they kept marching. And thankfully for the Confederacy, they did, because they arrived at Spotsylvania Courthouse in what we know as Laurel Hill minutes, and I mean literally minutes, before uh, Union troops uh, approached and started to shake out a battle line and... Uh, uh, attack Laurel Hill. Following, and this is on May the 8th, that night, the second corps of the Army of Northern Virginia starts to arrive. And it's led by Robert Rhodes' division. He shifts past the first corps. You know, as they do it, you want somebody in place as you're moving forward, right, to extend the lines. Behind him comes Edward Johnson's division. And Edward Johnson's division arrives 9 o'clock or so. It's pretty dark. In the distance, some of the men said they could see flickering campfires, and they figured it was Union troops out there. 
and they halted on a small rise, and that's where they stopped. And Johnson ordered his men to start to dig in. Now, extensive field works in the east only began really, well, you know, if you go to Culp's Hill, you can see, you know, where the line was, right, and they built them there, and that's it in the Gettysburg battlefield. Really, uh, any real use of them was the mine run campaign in late November of 1863, where Lee's troops built field works. Johnson, and they had some in the wilderness at, uh, at the western end of Saunders Field and that, uh, and other places, but mainly there. So he ordered his men to start to build them. Well, they, they were too tired. They were completely exhausted. And I don't care what an officer says, we're, we're going to go. And men literally dropped where they were, and they went to sleep. This is how, if you will, in the middle of the night where they can't see, but they know the rise of ground is there, this is going to be the focus of what becomes the mule shoe. The next morning, Lee will arrive, and the men are starting then to build these breastworks. Now, the breastworks, when they were finished, were about four feet. Now, it's going to take two days from the 9th, and they're going to work on them on the 10th, and they're going to work on them on the 11th. They were four foot high. Uh, they, had a, would, they eventually would have a head log, uh, and they dug a trench. Uh, down from them, and he also put steps in so they could step up and fire through the headlog. Uh, Lee arrived that morning, saw it once as he's touring it and talking to officers. It's a salient. It's vulnerable to three attack from three sides. And Lee says to him, and I will quote, this is a wretched line. I do not see how it can be held. You will argue, Johnson argued, now wait a minute, General. If we abandon this high ground, Union are going to come forward, put artillery on it, and threaten our lines. We can hold it. What we need is cannon to support infantry. Johnson had about 4,000 men, if you will, in his division. So Lee reluctantly agreed to that. He ordered Ewell to strengthen the works and... Uh, he ordered in the two battalions of 2nd Corps artillery in total 29 cannon, and they would be placed behind them. When the mule shoe is finished, as we think about the mule shoe, well, it was built on land owned by Neil McCool. He called it Woodshaw Farm. Now, McCool's away, but his three sisters are there when the Confederates came to the area. If you take it, the uh, McCool farm, and by the way, uh, these buildings I talk about, they're all gone. Uh, Landrum, Harrison, McCool, but the sites are there. It would be about a half a mile across. It would be another uh, uh, roughly, no, excuse me, three quarters of a mile wide, half mile deep. Okay. They also built a reserve line of works, not as extensive by any means at the base of it. Uh, uh, where John Gordon's men, he was the last division of the 2nd Corps uh, to come in. He's only a division commander, just been assigned that because Jewel Early is assigned to command of the 3rd Corps because A.P. Hill is in an ambulance. He's ill again, and he is brought to Spotsylvania in an ambulance uh, from the wilderness. That's the situation. Oh, by the way, then, what they do build, and if you go there... You can certainly see the, it's like somewhat like Culp's Hill. You can see where it is. You can see where the, the east angle, the work's been around like that. So you have an east angle and you have a west angle. The bloody angle is the west angle, okay? And they, they bend back down. If you start at one end where basically Rhodes' troops were, or some of his, you know, they're part of it, and go the whole way around, you're looking at at least two miles in total uh, that covered the ground there. Uh, they, what they also built uh, are traverses, you know, to protect the flanks. The only traverse I know of in Gettysburg, if you go to Culp's Hill, where the lit, lower Culp's and upper Culp's meet, that's where they, uh, Green's men with 137th New York uh, built a traverse to protect the flank. Here there's an extensive network of traverses. They generally were 12 to 15 feet. This is according to to the soldiers. There are no traces of the traverses there today. There have not been there for a long, long time. 
So you can't, we, we're not even sure exactly where they were, but they're within. And they become critical to the Confederates and the fighting that occurs there. They were about 12 to 15 feet length. Uh, they were three-sided. Uh, soldiers called them either a horse stall or a hog pen. That's what they reminded them of. Uh, and they were extensive. And as one of them said, the only thing that saves them is going to be those traverses. Uh, you're well aware of Emory Upton's attack on May the 10th. Now, please keep in mind, the Union, and this is what's remarkable about all this, the Union Army, uh, High Command, Grant, Meade, they, they really didn't know. <laughs> they knew it was there. They didn't know what it looked like, the shape of it. They didn't know how many troops defended it. They didn't know whether there was artillery in it or anything. But they knew it was there, and Emory Upton, who, you know, is a great student of war. Uh, he will eventually write a book and all that, but he's also, he, I was reminded, he reminded me of an evangelist, too, and what he believed about fighting. You know, he wanted to do this. And he proposes on May the 10th an assault on this section of Confederate works. And he had been at uh, Rappahannock Station in November where they stacked them. And he told them, I, have, I want a dozen regiments I will stack them in four lines, three regiments across, and we will assault. Give it a depth. And as we break through, and he expected to break through, we will fan out. And late in the day, and he was supposed to be supported by Gershon Mott's 2nd Corps Division. Well, Gershon Mott, uh, is not, this is not one of his better, well, he, he, is, he doesn't have very many good days, I can figure. But anyhow, uh, they really basically advance a little bit. Confederate artillery starts firing on them, and they just sort of stop. Of course, he doesn't tell Upton this, and there's no, there's no relay of information. And Upton's attack goes through, and it breaks through. It overruns a Confederate battery. The first line, and it was his brigade, three, uh, three regiments for his brigade of the Sixth Corps, they fan out and come in behind him. The problem is this is the interior line thing, and Confederate counterattacks immediately come forward. By the way, Lee rides forward. In fact, Lee's within about 200 yards of the breakthrough. And Union artillery are also supporting Upton's attack. One shell literally goes underneath Traveler. Finally, the staff gets Lee out of there, and he's very reluctant to do that because he doesn't know how this is going to be expanded. And so consequently, uh, these Confederate counterattacks seal the breach, but the, uh, Upton's men will fight there for an hour. They're going to hang on and fight for an hour until they're finally driven back. Grant learns of this. Now, it's difficult to assess this because we know, well, I'll, I'll just jump ahead. The, Grant is famous. He regrets two assaults, the one at Vicksburg and June 3rd at Cold Harbor. He, and already he's starting to believe that he is the Army of Northern Virginia a little bit on the edge. There's a possibility we can break them. And he even will believe that on June the 3rd, 1864. He seems to start to believe this now. And so when he hears of Upton's attack and how it broke through, he thought, well, maybe we can do it on a larger scale. So on May the 11th, he orders an assault by the best corps in the Army of, North, of the Potomac at that time yet. Well, they'll tell you, anytime you'd ask them, they'd tell you they're the best corps. I mean, we're the ones that charged, you know, the long mow at Fredericksburg in front of that wall. We're the ones that held Cemetery Ridge. We're the ones that retook uh, uh, the wheat, uh, you know, we stopped the, the attack in the wheat field. This is the second corps. And arguably, they probably were. And they give it to Winfield Scott Hancock. One thing about Hank, you know, he had that great physical bearing, and there's no question he was one of the true heroes here at Gettysburg. But he's badly wounded, as many of you remember. In fact, he was getting daily treatments in this, during the start of this campaign for that Gettysburg wound, and it sapped some of his strength. But he is blessed with three of the best division commanders in the Army, in Francis Barlow, John Gibbon, and David Burney. Some of the Third Corps troops, Bernie's division was in the reorganization, put and Mott, 
put into the second corps. And Gershom Mott's the fourth division. Roughly about 20,000 uh, officers and men in the second corps. So the order goes out that night of May the 11th. Now, meanwhile, they tried to find out, well, where, what about the mule shoe? Well, you know, well, the problem is Confederate skirmishers were out in front of it, and they didn't allow anybody close to it. It was still a guess. So the, the Second Corps marches that night, just one of the worst marches they had. It, it's starting to rain already. Barlow is at the front. His division leads it. Barlow, if you don't know, <clears throat> if you want to know the truth about something, ask Francis Barlow. He'll, he'll tell you. He don't care who he, you know, who it was that he didn't like to hear. Francis Barlow was that kind of a Yankee. Anyhow, he tells the guides, he's, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, now make sure you're going in the right direction because I don't want to march around the whole world and come up on the other side. Okay? Anyhow, they go there, and they go, the staging area is the home of a John Brown. And this is where they're going to be, uh, meet to start the staging. Interesting, Hancock follows them. He has to stop at Horatio Wright's Sixth Corps headquarters because, you know, John Sedgwick's killed in the ninth. He had to ask directions. How do I get to the Brown House? This is the Corps commander who's going to uh, oversee this assault. And they're going to meet in the house. But what in information do we have? And the only information they really had on it was the fact that it's out there. You know, it's somewhere south of where we are. And roughly what it was, it'd be about three quarters of an hour. So uh, the, the, the apex, if you will, which was 300 yards across of the, of the mule shoe, uh, was about three quarters of a mile south of Brown House. So they round up this officer in Mott's division. Now remember, they didn't go far. They really had no idea exactly where it was on May the 10th. He's brought to the Brown House and he sketches a map on the wall. In the words of, and I will quote Barlow, at times there is a sense of the ludicrous, of the absurdity of the situation prevailed over the feeling of responsibility and indignation. They knew what we, were, we had to be responsible, but there's no sense of what we're doing. One of his staff officers said they never saw him so depressed as he was on that morning. Now the attack was supposed to go forth at 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, but it was raining, it was very dark. Uh, Hancock conferred with Barlow. Now, by the way, Barlow, too, in the conference that they had, Barlow says, I'm going to stack my brigades. In other words, he's going to stack his four brigades like Upton stacked his regiments. Well, Bernie and Gibbon said, no, you don't want to do that. We, we're going to go into linear formation. Barlow says, I don't care what you're doing, I'm doing, I'm stacking my brigades, and so he stacked his brigades. They are going to be the spearhead of this assault because they're going to hit the eastern face of it. Uh, next to them will come Bernie. Uh, Mott's behind Bernie, and Gibbon will be the reserve, but he's going to be drawn in, and he's going to swing in behind. I'm not going to refight this, okay, <laughs> in that kind of detail. In the mule shoe, meanwhile, that night, well, late afternoon, if you will, Robert E. Lee's in the mule shoe again. He still does not like the situation at all. And he receives a message from his son, Rooney Lee, cavalry commander. He's on the right flank near the Fredericksburg Road. And he sees movement. And Lee interprets that as uh, a movement towards uh, uh, F Fredericksburg, towards Richmond. And he believes that Grant is doing what he just had done in May the 7th and 8th. He's shifting south. And so what he does is he orders the artillery. The artillery had brought in, they cut a road path, if you will. It's, it's roots. It's, uh, it's, you don't want to, in a hurry, you're not going to take cannon and caissons and limbers across this road. So Lee makes the decision to withdraw the 29 cannon. He will replace them with two batteries. A cannon. Uh, Gordon Ray, and by the way, if you, Gordon Ray's books on the Overland campaign are probably the finest study of a campaign in the Civil War. I mean, we're talking five books. 
Okay. So anyhow, Gordon Ray says it's one of the worst decisions of Lee ever made is a misjudgment on Lee's part. They're pulled out after dark. Nobody told Edward Johnson this. He sees them go, and he wants to find out what's going on. And again, there's a lack of communication between them. So, Johnson will be later, he, the men camp down during the night as the Union Second Corps is preparing uh, to, you know, get into ranks, battle formation. Union bands are playing music, and that music filters back. Skirmishers report that there's something going on. We can hear the tread. We know that there's something going on. So Johnson orders his, his, four, his brigades for him to be on the alert and ready to, uh, at early morning. And they will be. They're going to be in the works. Most of them are going to be. Some of the men are straggling and all that, but they're going to be in the works. Well, there's this argument about it's wet and the muskets didn't work, the rifles didn't work. Uh, that primarily was a little bit of a Stonewall Brigade, and they very quickly would rectify that. But they simply are going to be swamped. They're going to start out at 4.35 a.m., 20,000. It's the largest attack of the Second Corps in its history. And they are going to, Barlow's going to hit the eastern face. Bernie's going to hit the apex. And they're going to, and it's, they're going to, well, where they hit is right where the east angle is. It's Witcher's Brigade. Um, he was new in command. The problem was three of his regiments were along the Landrum Lane. They were the skirmishers. And as they pour over, they're outnumbered immediately. They're the first ones to break. Later on, some of them will argue that, oh, that, they're the cause of all our problems. That's unfair. They really basically never had a chance. Barlow's men will then hit uh, George Stewart's brigade. Stewart's going to be captured early on in, in the fighting. And then they just go down the line to the Louisiana. The Louisiana were in two sections. Or, it's one brigade, but two sections. You know, there's two Louisiana brigades, and they combined them because of losses. And then they hit the Stonewall Brigade and that. And they start to go right down in. What happens is within probably certainly the first 30 minutes or so, maybe 45, and it becomes a reality of what's going to happen, Barlow, Gibbon, once their men are in it, Bernie and Mott, they lose control. I mean, they have just broken through the middle, if you will, or one of the major parts of the Army in Northern Virginia. They can't see it because it's raining and dark, but they have created this breach in the line that threatens the existence of the Army of Northern Virginia. And they start to penetrate deeper into the salient. Meeting them is John Gordon. You know the old saying the soldier said about just looking at him would put fight into a plucked chicken. Anyhow, he's one of the best division commanders. Well, he's new to it, but John Gordon is superb. And also in the here is what some have argued is the finest corps, excuse me, division commander in the Army in Northern Virginia, and that's Robert Rhodes. And his troops are going to be in it. What happens is Gordon's men are first. He has that baseline. Uh, he had two brigades in there, one down at the base works, and he initially ordered a counterattack. I think it's worth repeating. I like this quote. I'm going to read it to you. It, it was not about this. But I think you're going to see it here in the fields of Gettysburg or other places. This is a, a historian of the 63rd Pennsylvania on, on attacks, he said, and I quote, When the Union men charged, it was with heads erect, shoulders square and thrown back, and with a firm stride. But when the Johnnies charged, it was with a jog trot in a half-bent position as though they might be met with heavy and blighting volleys. They came on with the pertinacity of bulldogs, filling up the gaps and trotting on with their never ceasing kayai until we found them face to face. And at about five o'clock, 5.15, on May the 12th, the Yankees found them face to face at those reserve line of works. Gordon had pulled back his two brigades and they, make the, they get there before the Yankees do Robert E. Lee rides forward. Lee, by the way, Lee's always up early. Uh, he's up, generally speaking, about 3 a.m. He goes, goes to headquarters, 
anywhere from 10 to 11 or something like that. But he was up again maybe 3.30 an hour before. He rides to the Harrison House, which was Jules' headquarters, Edgar Harrison House, and he is going to be there. He rides forward. Gordon said, we don't know what's going on. We just hear sounds. And so the sounds are coming, and, the, uh, you know, Lee rides forward, meets Gordon. And Gordon immediately senses that General Lee, like he had in May the 6th in the wilderness, or May the 10th here in Upton's attack, but now, once again, it looks like Lee wants to lead the uh, counterattack. Gordon stops him, said, General, these are Virginians and North Carolinians, and that they'll never let you down. They never have let you down. Somebody, they think it was a sergeant, one of the regiments, I think in the 49th Virginia, he grabs the reins of the traveler and he just turns the horse's head. And uh, Lee says something, in fact, you know, I'm depending on you, please do. But they lead him out of there. And so Gordon sends his men forward. This stops the real penetration of the Union attack force at those line of works. Along the edges, Lane's Brigade, which is Third Corps, uh, is there. They have called it Lane's Salient. His men will turn. They're overrun a little bit, but they turn. And then the ones that I said, the Louisianans and them, and part of Rhodes' men, they are going to turn, and they're going to stop the penetration along the original works as the men would come to call them. What follows is that the Confederates are going to a counterattack, and a series of brigades are going to go in. I can tell you if you want to know who they are, I'm glad to tell you. But in a total, with, starting with Gordon, they are going to go forward. Uh, there's going to be a, a total of nine uh, Confederate brigades that are going to go into the counterattack. The last one to go in are Sam McGowan, South Carolinians. And they're going to go in between 8 and 9 o'clock. This is how prolonged the fighting is. What happens, folks, is something beyond the, any of their experience. It simply is. I, you know, I know a little bit about something. I'm not, you know, I, I, my guess is, and I'll just tell you this, and this is an opinion, what follows is the worst day in American military history for the combatants. It's going, no other place in the Civil War. There's just simply no place like it. They are going to be, and I could walk forward here and be about three to four feet from this gentleman and that's how they fought for 20 hours in places. And I, there's certainly no place like that in the Civil War. Arguably, there may no been no place like that in all of American military history for the men who were caught there. The Confederates, in fact, are trapped. They can't get out. If they get out, Lee's army's in jeopardy of being destroyed. Now, Lee, what he does is he orders the remnants of Johnson's division and other troops to build a reserve line, and they're going to start building that reserve line right away. But the Confederates have to hang on until that reserve line way back to link the wings of the army again has to be built and fortified. And so it comes down to this. As John Hale, a private in the 17th Maine, would write, all... As, they're coming in, and now it's chin. All around the sailing was a seething, bubbling, roaring hell of hate and murder. A Yankee called it the death grapple of the war. You read their accounts, it's, well, should say, you know, you're, you're a Civil War story, and you think you know something. Well, then you find out, well, I'm going to write a book on this, and you find out you don't really know anything. <laughs> you know, you really don't know, you don't know the details. I was there about five years ago with my wife, and I'm standing at the mule shoe, and we're looking around, and you know, I'm looking for something to write about. I'd written a book on Northern businessmen. I wanted to get back to folks shooting each other, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And that's what I hope I do better than I normally other things. But anyhow, uh, well, you gotta be a little cynical being a historian. But anyhow, uh, I said to my wife, there's a good story here. And to me, it, it always, I, you know, whether I, I don't know whether to do it well or do it not, whatever, but I always had to have a good story to me to write about because I, I look at myself as 
hopefully trying to tell a story that people would like. But anyhow, I came back and found out there was only one book in this mule shoe attack. And that was done about 20 years ago. It's not a bad book, but there's no letters, there's no diary, because that historian did not have to do that, right? So that's how it started in this. But I had no idea. The other thing, too, I'm not, you know, just to make a point, I grew up two hours north of here. And in August of 25th, 1862, 85 men from my hometown area, I live east of State College, but I grew up in a little town called Reversburg. It has a unique, maybe the, no, I shouldn't say unique, they have the rare monument in all of Pennsylvania. They actually, the folks of my hometown in the middle of the depression raised 400 and some dollars to put a monument up to the men who stood in the main street of my hometown and were sworn in in August of 62. By the way, Reversburg still only has one street, okay? It's that small. But then I had a, my fifth and sixth grade teacher knew the veterans. He was in his 60s, this is the mid 50s, right? And he told us the stories. And I got hooked. Well, on May the 12th, 1864, Company A of the 148th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry were in the front rank of Barlow's division. In fact, their Colonel James Beaver accepted the sword of uh, Marilyn Stewart. He thought it was Jeb Stewart because Stewart says to him, I'm General Stewart. And Beaver said, Jeb Stewart? He said, no, I'm George Stewart. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, <laughs> But to me, you know, but folks, when you get into this, I, I well, I'm, I'm going to let some of them tell you what it's all about. There's simply nothing to compare to them. Lieutenant James Caldwell, 1st South Carolina. The question became pretty plainly whether one was willing to meet death, not merely to run the chances of it. And if you read soldiers problems with combat, that was it. It was the uncertainty of it. As one of them said, you know, combat like that is very democratic. It doesn't matter who you are, right? You can be whatever rank you are, whatever, you know, it's, it's random, it's going to get you, and that. North Carolina soldier, at noon, the water so, was so bloody in the ditches that one inexperienced would have taken it for blood in tar. Men were drowning in the, in the water and blood in the Confederate. Now, remember, they're on opposite sides. The Yankees, at one point, the, the dead and wounded on the outside of the original blessed works were three feet high because they couldn't get it. And they go back through it. There was a law about 4 o'clock, and one of the Confederates stood up and looked out across there, and all he saw was bodies, some breathing, some just steel, the whole way across the open ground there. There was one instant, and there's so many that it's like all things are seared into your memory. But many of these men, things were just, they, they couldn't forget it. In North, in the South Carolina Regiment, I don't know if it's the first, it might have been the 14th. A young soldier slumps down, and he's lying against the breastwork, and he's dead. Another soldier comes up to him, it's his father. And he wants to see his son, and the next thing you know, a bullet finds the father, and he dies on top of his son. Lieutenant Harvey Welk, 84th Pennsylvania. I never, during over four years of active service in the Army, witnessed so many individual acts of daring and foolhardiness on the part of soldiers on this day. Many men would, literally, they had it. They get, they jump up in the breastworks, their comrades pass their muskets up, to, or rifles, and they start firing down in. Other men will get up, and they'll, they'll throw their rifles as spears uh, into them. Uh, one man from uh, Vermont, uh, Knowles is his name, he, he survived. It's simply amazing. He, he survived, not only survived, he won the Medal of Honor for what he did. One Confederate soldier, the estimate is, he stood there, and they passed up altogether 100 rounds 100 rifles to him, and he fired him. He wasn't hit until finally, as one of them said, he just simply slumped down, and that was it. Of course, he's killed. Massachusetts soldier. It was so bloody and had such an aspect of savage about it. But I think, really, uh, one of the best quotes comes from a Mississippian, Private David Holt. 
of the 16th Mississippi. This is Nate Harris's brigade. They, they're on the other side of the bloody angle, as we know. Uh, McGowan South Carolinians are basically the ones around on the long part of the apex, not entirely. And please keep in mind, the fighting is just simply not over these breastworks. They're among, at one point, as one soldier, Confederate said, we just had to crawl up the hill and take one traverse after another traverse after another traverse to get to the original works. So there's fighting within the mule shoe among the traverses. But here's what Private David Holt said. I don't expect to go to hell. But if I do, I am sure hell can't be that terrible scene. Indeed, I am sure that the hell on earth is the pledge for the hell after death. He couldn't, he couldn't remember anything compared to this. About 6 p.m., Yule sent orders down. And by the way, this is not one of Richard Yule's better days, too. Uh, well, he could cuss like any trooper you want to find. And he initially was going to be cussing men out, of course, He's doing that beside Robert E. Lee. Well, Lee had to come. Now, we don't know exactly when this happened, but clearly Lee told him, you know, General, how can you be this way and expect the men to react? But about 6 o'clock, order came down. They passed it along the line. We're going to start withdrawal. Now, it ended up probably that order became a mockery because the fact of the matter is they don't really start withdrawing to 3 a.m. on May the 13th. So however you want to count it, now the fighting starts to subside about midnight. So but 20 hours, 20, you know, whatever you want to call it, it starts to subside. As they, they will pull out quietly, uh, the Yankees do not even know they're going. One of them, one of the Confederates wrote, as he got out of there, he said, we look like a lot of painted devils. We could hardly tell one another apart. They had been there for all that period of time, uh, rain, mud, whatever. When it's over and they count it up, it's 17,500 casualties. Uh, the usual figure has been about 17. I found a Provo Marshal's report. The actual Confederate, they said like 3,000 of Johnson's men were captured. Provo Marshal has it about 3,500. So uh, how, well, what about that? Well, I looked, and I looked, and I hope I'm right, you know. I really do hope I'm right, but I looked and looked and looked and looked. It's the bloodiest day between tomorrow here, July 1863, in the East to Appomattox. Not, Mule, not June 3rd, because the Confederate casualties in June 3rd were what, maybe 1,500? This is the bloodiest day of it all. And um, the Iranian. Ironic part of it all, I guess, in a way, and I'll end here. Uh, this is, you know, we know the scenes here. We know 1913. We know otherwise, you know, many of the regiments came back when they put down their monument out here. You know, you know Gettysburg to the Army of Potomac's redemption, right? <laughs> you know, we, we finally got what we've been looking for for years, and that was a fair fight in a fair field. You know, and they got it here at Gettysburg. And it got led by people who knew what they were doing here. Uh, and they, they, they come back. They don't come back to the mule shoe. There's one reunion I know of, uh, 15th New Jersey, 6th Corps. They are going to place a monument, and uh, they're going to face uh, the South Carolinians, and they're going to, uh, they captured a flag, because literally they were able to grab flags, you know. Men would put, take them right up to the point there. And so they returned the flag. This is about 1910, 1912. The title of my book, and then I'll end it. In the early 1900s, a northern Ohioan, he came on a visiting tour of the wilderness, Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, and he hired a Confederate get veteran as his guide. And he ended up at the mule shoe, and he ended up standing at the bloody angle. Now, please keep in mind, again, I forgot, this is the place where that 22-inch diameter tree was sawed off by rifle fire. And by the way, Nelson Miles, who commanded the brigade, he'll come back in 65. He's the one that find, they hid it in town. <laughs> the guy that owned the hotel, he hid the, he hid the law, he hid the stump. Well, they found, somebody turned him in to Miles and they got, and, they, and it would be in front of the War Department for a, while, a number of years, anyhow. Uh, 
they're standing at the bloody angle. And the Ohio man says, it must have been terrible here. And the Confederate veteran turned to him and said, no, it was the heart of hell. Thank you. Jeff, we've got to get you into where you can sign your book. You've got to get, everybody says, Wayne, I can't have another Civil War book. I, look, I'm the president and CEO of the Gettysburg Foundation, and it's not true, everybody. <laughs> get as many as you can get your hands on, is, yeah. is what I say. And you want to get a copy of The Heart of Hell, because this story is, if you're interested in military operations in the Civil War, this story is one of the most desperate you're going to see anywhere. And Jeff has chronicled. Jeff, we thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Enjoy now, the day. We're going to rush you off to get you inside to sign books. You want to take a water with you, go ahead and get one. Jeff will be in there at 1030. Now, let me just say, everybody, before you go, 11 o'clock here in the tent, Britt Eisenberg and, of course, Jim Hessler. If you've not seen the new exhibit, a Rough Course Life, be sure to get in there and take a look at it. And if you want to support more programs like this and you're not a member of the Friends, go to the Friends desk and they can help you with that. Help bring these educational programs here. We're so proud of them. Thank you so much. We've got a half-hour break and a lot to do. Thanks.